Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to Episode 7 of the Play Podcast, where we explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain for our play today rises on a man and a woman standing in a queue at Ikea, although this is not immediately apparent because there is no queue visible. The stage is empty because the introductory stage directions for this play explicitly state that it is written to be performed throughout on a bare stage. No furniture, no props, no costume changes. This minimalist scene is the opening of British playwright Duncan McMillan's play, Lungs, which premiered in Washington, D.C. in 2011 in a co-production with the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield, where it also opened in the same year. When it transferred to London, it won the Best New Play Award in the 2013 Off West End Awards. It was revived in a high-profile production in 2019 at the Old Vic Theatre in London, directed by Artistic Director Matthew Warkus and starring Matt Smith and Claire Foy. At the time we are recording this episode, in June 2020, the same cast are about to reprise their roles, giving a socially distanced performance of the play live on the stage at the Old Vic. This production is different, however, because with the coronavirus preventing theatres from opening, the Old Vic have taken the bold initiative of presenting the performance live, but in an empty auditorium. The performance will be live streamed to approximately 1,000 customers, the usual capacity of the theatre, who have purchased a ticket to watch from home at the appointed time. The playwright Duncan McMillan is the author of a number of other plays, including Every Brilliant Thing, a funny and heart-wrenching monologue that enjoyed sold-out runs at the Edinburgh Festival for three years running and has toured the UK and the world. People, Places, Things, an unflinching look at alcohol and drug addiction, which opened at the National Theatre in 2015 and subsequently transferred to the West End and to New York. Denise Goff won an Olivier Award as Best Actress in the lead role in that production. He also co-wrote and co-directed an adaptation of George Orwell's 1984 with writer-director Robert Icke, which has had three runs in the West End and toured the UK and played on Broadway in 2017. Joining me as my guest today via video conference to talk about Duncan's play Lungs is George Spender, who until 2018 was the editorial director at specialist drama publisher Oberon Books where he was responsible for publishing many of the leading British playwrights of the past decade, including Laura Wade, Tanika Gupta, Lem Sisse, Simon Stone, Robert Icke, Barney Norris, Alice Birchall, among many, many others. Most importantly for us, Oberon published all of Duncan Macmillan's plays, including Lums. More recently, George has worked for the Edinburgh International Festival and the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School, and has launched a new publishing company called Salamander Street which specializes in new dramatic writing, of course, and in theater in education. Welcome, George. Thanks so much for giving in to my persistent pressure to join me on this podcast. Very nice to see you, Douglas. Thanks for having me. Uh, my usual first question on the podcast is, where did you first come across or see Lungs? I've been trying to pin down exactly when I first came across it, because checking the publication date, which was, I think, March 2012. I'm pretty sure I, we must have published it at Oberon before I saw it. And I'm certain I saw the Payne's Plough roundabout production in 2012, the Richard Wilson directed one. And I think a few of us from Oberon went, I so said we had a bit of a, a work outing to go and see it. But I, I think it's been this really enduring presence in my career because it's done so amazingly well and the tour has been revived again and again and it's had all these incredible productions all over the world. It's amazing that such a kind of small play in a way can have such an enormous life. Yeah, had you published Duncan's first play yet before that? Were you Duncan's publisher at that point or was this a punt that you took with Lungs? It was before my time. I think the very first play that Oberon published would have been signed up by James Hogan, and I'm pretty sure it was The Most Humane Way to Kill a Lobster, which was on at Theatre 503. And then Oberon had published Duncan's play Monster as well, 
but this was my first encounter with Duncan. And I think, I think most of the team then were fairly new to the company. So it was, it was our sort of first exposure to Duncan, but not, not the first published play of his. But it felt new to you and, it, and, and a good thing too, because, you know, Duncan's gone on to write more great plays and more success as well for himself and for Oberon. Oh, he's had, um, had the dream career for a playwright, hasn't he? I mean, you couldn't ask for a better run of shows. It's really astonishing. Yes, and I think Lungs is, you know, started that for him. My first uh, encounter with his work was when I saw Every Brilliant Thing at the uh, festival in Edinburgh. Mm. And as you know, Every Brilliant Thing is a monologue that involves interaction with the audience. In fact, I would go so far as to say it involves quite a lot of audience participation. And I confess personally that I would go a long way to avoid audience participation. <laughs> and I remember when we were in Edinburgh, I was with a colleague who it turned out was even more paranoid about participating than me. And when we discovered that there was audience participation, she refused to go in to the show. <laughs> I was brave enough to go in. Um, but made sure I sat near the back and I did not get involved, as it turned out. But I have to say that I was the lucky one because it was a magical show. And that introduced me to Duncan McMillan's work. I then saw People, Places and Things when it took London by storm. And like most people who saw that, was blown away. So that led me to read Lungs, by which time, I'd never seen it, but by which time I was hugely jealous that you had published Duncan at Oberon and that we hadn't at Samuel French. And of course, then I had to see the old Vic production last year. And I can only say I was more excited about the chance to see the play than to see the stars of The Crown, uh, who I know was a huge draw to many. What we usually do on our podcast, George, is for those who haven't had the chance yet to see or read the play, I wonder if you might give us a brief summary of what goes on uh, in the play. Before you do, I'm going to just say a quick warning to listeners that our conversation today, starting right now, I expect, is almost certain to include spoilers. So if you're about to see the old Vic production online and don't want to know what happens in advance, you'll need to turn off now and come back to listen to us afterwards, as long as you do come back, though. So, George, with that intro, can you just give us a, a brief summary of what, this, what goes on in this play? The drama begins as it often does in Ikea, and it starts with a question. Faced with the emergence of the climate emergency, an unnamed young couple question whether it's right to bring a child into the world. They question whether they are good enough people to do so. They recycle, they give money to charity, they do fun runs. Surely they're the type of people who should be having children. It's a conversation that lasts until the very end of their lives. It's a pretty huge play for something that on the surface seems kind of slight. Well, not slight, but swift, I guess, would be a good yes. way of describing it. It's not long, but a big subject, a mm. couple of big subjects. Actually, I was also thinking, strangely, we often overlook this thought or question, which is, why do you think the play is called Lungs? Because it, that isn't completely straightforward, I think, in terms of a literal description of what's about to happen. I wish I had a magic answer for you there, or I could reveal some previously unheard knowledge. I'd always wondered if it's something as straightforward as the planets <laughs> breathing. I, 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 really do, I really struggle to think of a good, concise answer to that. I, well, no, I think you're onto something there, because when I started thinking about it, I thought maybe it's some reference to the prospective baby's lungs that, you yeah. know, they're all talking about a, the potential newborn, which in the cliche, take their first breath or scream, burst forth from the new baby. Mm. But actually also, as you say, tying into one, perhaps a metaphoric idea of the Earth's atmosphere, the lungs of the planet which of course the theme being that we're fast consuming all of this available air to the billions of lungs of the population of the earth to which this baby will be another addition. And that is obviously one of the themes of the play. And the other bit I picked up on was that throughout the play, there are two characters, it should be said, only and no more, and they are not named. But he is often saying to her, breathe, 
as in relax, slow down, calm yourself, put things in perspective, try and restore balance, something along those lines. So all that kind of mishmash came together and thinking, well, maybe it's not that, not that indirect a, a title after all. But I wanted to return to the start, to the stage directions that we were talking about before the curtain rises and ask you what you thought about there being no set. What do you think this does for the way the play works or how we respond to it? I believe it was written almost as a reset for the playwright to have a bit of a break from thinking in rigidly formal ways of writing. I think he'd just been working on a very large scale play. I'm not sure whether it happened or not, but it's almost like a refresher and a, an opportunity to just strip away everything unnecessary and have some fun with almost language and performance alone. Yeah, so as I understand it, you're right, that he he was working on a bigger piece with a lot more characters and all that kind of thing. And he took a break and wrote this initially very quickly. But what else does it do? There's something more to it than that. There's something deliberate about that. It obviously paired back without the sets and lots of characters. And I guess it somehow, I think I was thinking about this, it somehow focuses you on the content of what they're saying, the debate and issues that they're having, rather than any other paraphernalia in their lives. So it, the minimalism works, I think, to set their conversation against. He said, in fact, somewhere that the, this lack of set should allow the audience to fill in the gaps. That's somewhat engaging for an audience, of course. There, there's, mm -hmm. there's a dynamic. And energy. When, there's, when there's no differentiation between scenes, you can go from one location to another or be fighting or laughing or doing something else in the next line with no real yes. announcement that you're doing so. It's, it's great. No interruption, of course. You don't have to change sets or do any of that. So it just flows. And you're right, he's incredibly effective at transitioning these scenes just by the language, what they say in the first line or two of a new scene. Because to go back to the summary, they basically, the play takes place over some time. And, these, and there's a, it's a, essentially a series of conversations over time where um, they're debating the question, as you said at the beginning, about whether they should have a baby together and what that would mean. And then when they reach those decisions, what the impact of that is, and all that is traced over time, but you know, it just flows seamlessly. There's no stopping. So the time does just move with the dialogue and it's very effective in doing that. I also, in fact, I also wanted to talk about the rhythm of the dialogue, the form of the dialogue because it's quite striking as well. It's pair, very pared back. It's quite a staccato rhythm, short and sharp, almost combative between them, interrupting each other and themselves. And I, at first I found that quite unsettling and I wondered whether he was just trying to suggest that their communication was dysfunctional or what do you think he was trying to achieve with this form of dialogue? It's really fantastic dialogue, isn't it? Because it's so heightened in one sense but also very naturalistic and the monologues in particular I think are just so fluid and well structured and convey so much while being in long broken sentences with a comma and um, I'm sure you noticed in the play script Duncan's a keen user of a comma with space either side to denote a uh, a pause and there's no restriction on the length it's the playwright allowing the performer to make their own decision about the length of the pause which I think is incredibly freeing and I, I've seen more and more playwrights using this comma as a break now rather than beat or pause I think it's it's the new it's the new Carol Churchill slash really that yeah that's fascinating I mean and also you mentioned the monologues because initially it's as I said there's this rapid fire staccato back and forth between them. And then she launches in to quite an extensive speech, and which also is a slight surprise because of its length, but very fluent in the sense, fluent in the sense of it representing her real time thoughts. And I think he was trying, I think he's trying to, to do that, to make you feel like this mm. is really live, that we are literally, I think you said, eavesdropping on their conversations. They, I think they both say they're just talking aloud thinking aloud, don't they? they um, things are coming out of their mouths that are 
just hitting their brain. Yes, and that they and that makes them you know it's just pouring out of them in real time in a sense uncensored. And in doing this, you believe they are thinking it for the first time, but also it's sort of it's open and vulnerable and unedited. So you feel like it's more honest. You feel like this is something true. That sense, I think, just happens because of the nature of the way he's written this dialogue. And therefore, you buy into that. The nature of being a couple who become more and more comfortable with each other and almost have this shorthand between them and that emotional openness, I think, is so wonderfully conveyed by these characters. That's absolutely right, too. You're absolutely right. It's the pattern of people who do know each other really well, that finish each other's sentences or know where they're going before and can jump in and are anticipating where this is going and respond in a shorthand. There's a really good line that the male character says when he says, I don't know what you want. I need you to give me some clues, which I think is just spot on. Yeah. Well, I think he has some problems understanding what she wants in the play. And in fact, that made me think about the form of the play I was going to say was it's a form of conversation over time, as I said. And it's the kind of thing that you can do when you're a couple, as we've, all, as we've just alluded to, or with friends or something, where you can be a conversation that's sort of going over years even, that's continuing underneath what you're doing day to day. And you can just dive back into at a minute's notice, and both parties will know what they're talking about, that we're back on to this level of conversation and pick it up. And I think that's what the form of the play and the nature of that their relationship seems to be. Does that sound right? Does that sound true? Yeah, spot on. I mean, it's, a, it's this conversation that lasts a lifetime, isn't it? And going back to the same issue again and again of whether you are living your life as you should do and are you achieving everything you want to and are you, are you living the best life you, you can be? Are you a good person? Yeah, so, but also returning to issues that somehow are there between them and may or may not have been resolved and are continuing unresolved and therefore have to be returned to, but they leave for a bit and then at certain moments it bubbles up again and, or bursts forth again and they, they confront it again together. I wanted to talk about their relationship because the speech also defines or differentiates their characters, doesn't it? The, the style of their speech. I thought initially she has this long speech where she's thinking about the implications of what it would be to be a mother. And she is full of energy. She seems to think out loud at great pace. She wears her heart and her head on her sleeve, so to speak. Whereas he is far more concise and direct and straightforward. It seemed to me, to some degree, an unlikely combination or cu couple. And, and as you've just said, he's not, he wonders whether he's on the same wavelength as her. Do you find them credible together? Uh, I definitely do, because I certainly recognize a lot of my own relationship. In that. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I very much find myself in his kind of reticence to really fully explain himself in the way that she is much more able to, to do so. I think she, she's a much more open, emotionally literate character. That's true. I find him quite hard to pin down. He feels more like a blank slate of sorts. He's, he's not really sure who he is, and nor are we. And he seems to be reacting more to her than taking the lead in his own life, doesn't he? She, she is the one with the energy driving things often. And she also seems to have, I think, possibly a deeper emotional substance than he does, uh, particularly um, in Claire Foy's performance at, in the old Vic production. There's real depth to the emotional journey she goes on. And he is sort of just trying to figure it out in a kind of not very successful way, isn't he? Mm. Well, he, he gives up his attempts at a creative career in order to support this new family he's got on the way, doesn't he? he a, he's in a band, isn't he? Or he's a musician of some kind. Yes, you don't, you don't get a lot of detail, but then you discover, I think you pick up that he's a musician part-time, works in a record store maybe part-time, mm -hmm. but slightly, yes, yeah, slightly feckless in that regard, I think. Sort of loses the way he's been defining himself and perhaps there's simmering resentment there. I wonder, in fact, that, you know, what do you make of the gender roles, how these characters are presented as representations of their gender in this relationship? Because as you say, there's that stereotypical 
he's now going to go out and get a proper job. And what is she to support her stay at home when she's the character with appears to be more drive. And you wonder whether, you know, he would be happy to be a part-time musician and a stay at home dad, but you know, she doesn't want him to do that. It seemed ironic to me. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess it must tap into Duncan's own experience of trying to make a living as a creative with a child on the way and the anxieties that brings. I guess I, I had wondered if more emotionally available female character is a bit of a cliche or not, but then it seems so well reflected in real life that I couldn't really call it that. I don't know. What do you think? Yes, I, she definitely has a warmth, a warmth and an emotional intelligence that he doesn't seem to be as well equipped with. And, you know, frankly, there's a truth in that often. You know, the cl- cliches carry some truth. They're not universally true, but they carry some truth potentially. And actually, I read somewhere, uh, Arifa Akbar in her review in The Guardian said that these two encapsulate the paradoxes of modern masculinity and empowered femininity enacting conflicts and contradictions. And um, that sounded pretty true to me, that there, mm-hmm. there is that going on, that there's, you know, blurring of those lines. And as I said, she seems to be a powerful character, but there's also these instincts that saying that she will stay at home and that he goes out and needs to have a proper job. And as you said, that I think that's really spot on about that tension or challenge for the creative person to make a living is perennially difficult. The central debate, of course, of the play, as we said at the top, is about the decision to become a parent and the responsibilities that go with it. I don't know, George, personally, if you're a parent, this actually speaks of a time of life, this play, very much. So I wondered if the specifics of this, how they resonated with you. I'm not yet a parent. I'm certainly considering it. And I always come back to this play when I think about parenthood, because I think it did have a huge effect on me in terms of should you be bringing a child into the world. And I think it really intelligently makes you question your choice to reproduce and whether that's the right one. And I, I'm, I'm not, I haven't reached a a decision yet on whether to start a family or not, but it's certainly certainly on my mind. I mean, you do you you have children? I do. You? We're not going to have a, a, a psychological <laughs> conversation about your personal choice, but it is it's interesting about how much personal soul searching goes on is prompted by our thinking about this question ourselves. He wrote the play probably in exactly the position you are in before he had actually had the children. And for that, I guess it's very accurate. And interestingly, having had children, and I think he may have said the same himself now, some years later, when you look back, some of these concerns just pale into some sort of insignificance (laughs) compared to the wonderful reality that follows. And it's sort of thinking, well, all that was academic, because compared to the enormity of what really happens and the differences that really occur, then, you know, you just ultimately, that debate is kind of moot. Just go for it. Um, You don't don't know until you take the plunge, do you? No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I think what's really interesting is the sort of soul searching that goes on, right? The sort of questions that you then start asking yourself, which you would, which I guess we do, but from time to time in our lives, but more pointedly about, for example, our personal qualities, who we are, to be equipped to be a parent, Knowing also that these qualities, for example, will be handed on genetically, you're thinking, okay, do I want to reproduce more people like me with all my faults? I think you start thinking about, I don't know whether you've thought about these things about, you know, how did my parents do this? They came to it, did the same thing. How did they reach these decisions? And then how did they manage it? And then, and if you think about your own parents, you think, wait a second, I'm still a child. Am I grown up enough to be a parent? (laughs) That's a hard one to believe, isn't it? How do you feel at this point? Yeah, I I think I would have been about 23, 24 when I first saw the play. And that was nearly 10 years ago now. So I'm probably about the age Duncan was when he wrote it or he was writing it or or not far off. So in a way, it, it, it speaks to me more now than it did when it first came out. And I think there's a reason for its enduring popularity is that it speaks to people at all stages of their life. 
as I get older, I start thinking more about family and who came before me and what this sort of, whether there are enduring qualities that are passed between generations. And I think it, it, family is the big, the big question, isn't it? It's, Absolutely, because of course it is, essential, it is essential to your identity. It is genetically is you, and then culturally, you know, whether it's nurture or nature, you've been raised in, the, in that family as well. So, you, you know, there's the questions, classic questions about, you know, will I be a parent like my parents? Am I going to behave in the same way? Well, there's a lot of reason why it wouldn't be surprising if you did. You have uh, inherited their genetic makeup. You've been given their model, whatever it is, and to, to witness for better or worse. So it's not surprising that I guess those sorts of things start to inform you to, to think about. I think he, he carries that on with every brilliant thing as well, doesn't he? About the kind of legacy of a depressive parent and whether that's passed on to the child through DNA or through lived experience. Yes, exactly. For better or for worse, as, you, as we say, it's unavoidable. Not to mention, I don't know, worrying about their future lives, as you said. I mean, you know, whether they'll be healthy, happy. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you, when you have the children as well, these, these don't stop, these worries. You carry on. Um, there's, that, there's, a great, there's a great line where she, she talks about <clears throat> they, they grow up and they start thinking their own thoughts and they buy their own clothes and they hate you. And I thought yeah. that was- Exactly. And I, I thought there's a, there's a point where she talks quite movingly, actually, about the vision she has of motherhood. And often these visions are of, very, of children at a very early age, of having a baby, for example. It, mm. Naturally, I guess we think of the first stages and are preoccupied by that. Rather than the longer term, it's harder to imagine exactly the kinds of adults that we're going to end up creating. But that is part of it. And that line you just referred to reminded me, there was an occasion where I, I was talking with, with a friend who had a number of children, and he said to me at one stage that he had an 18-year-old daughter who um, was being quite rebellious, and in fact, he basically said, you know what, I don't like her. The sooner she leaves home, the happier we'll all be. And I thought, Wow. You get to that point, you've been through all this, and you could still happen that you just basically don't like each other. So that, that's a, you know, a worry, a bit of a lottery as well. But as you say, they can grow up and hate you, or the other way around. You could yeah, there's that them. teenage cliche saying, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. We made the mistake. So yeah, she, it's interesting how she talks, I said at some point about her vision of it, and she had this vision innately about motherhood, something. I guess it's, it's, that was almost instinctive, isn't it? Because she actually admits that she hadn't really thought very clearly about who the partner would be, but she thought about herself as a mother and giving birth. And I guess there's basically some subconscious maternal instinct, but a very specific vision of what motherhood is. And where do those assumed visions come from of what you think it's going to be? Yeah, she talks about playing with dolls at one point, doesn't she? Or some reference to being a young girl. Yes. But I mean, I think she, she just has that classic kind of soft focus image of the bond between baby and mother. And mm. it, actually, a father is a bit in the background. Not with a, not with a blurred face and not, yes. a, a not sort of crystallized form. It's a, I think the other thing I thought was interesting is that this is uh, what I like about it as well is that they do spend a good amount of time, as we, are, as we are, talking about whether or not to do this and what it means and things, because sometimes you think it's ironic how significant this decision is, how little rational analysis you can actually bring to it ultimately, and how much you can't really know what you're getting into, but just have to take this leap of faith. I think there are many middle-class cliches about becoming a parent, which uh, I really enjoyed in the play. They're mainly, I don't know whether they're mainly for laughs, but they're also recognizable, of course, because they remind us of these cliches that are mainly true. You know, I don't know how many of these you recognize about mm. getting worked up about your prospective children being competitive in sports and, all, mm. and those sort of things. Yeah, there's a certain amount of millennial hand-wringing about the anxieties of becoming a parent and 
worrying about gender stereotype, you know, dolls and guns and, mm. and um, finding the right school or not pushing your kids too hard, but make sure they value education or even move to Brighton to have a big garden. Yeah. Um, big <laughs> enough, I thought there was a great line, big enough for a trampoline. <laughs> thought, yeah. <laughs> that, that's basically thinking well ahead. And also about being a parent who's not obsessed with our children to the point that we don't have our own lives, right? So they still want to go, I don't know, clubbing or mm. like that, and then or traveling anyway. Although I think, do they, they do go clubbing and then discover, actually, I don't like this anymore. Yeah, they're like, oh, should we go on a Friday? And they're like, oh, no, it'll be horrible on a Friday. They go on a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it goes back to your point of saying you personally, because one of the of the, the other major theme of the play is that personal compassion about whether having a child is adding to the population growth and propelling the climate change that's such a peril to our world. She says, I could fly to New York and back every day for seven years and still not leave a carbon footprint as big as if I have a child. 10,000 tons of CO2. That's the weight of the Eiffel Tower. I'd be giving birth to the Eiffel Tower. And when you mentioned this earlier, I mean, I talk about the world you're bringing the child into, but contributing to this. Is that, do you think that's a real factor? Would you be thinking about that yourself? I certainly think about that when I consider children. I it's tough not to worry about the direction the world heads in and the fact that we seem to be so short on time to solve this impending catastrophe and yet there's so little movement towards a solution. It does make you wonder if you'd be bringing children into a dystopian Mad Max style atmosphere. And, you know, what's, if you can't give your children a better life than the one you've had then should you be should you be having them in a sense yeah there's a couple of aspects to it aren't there i think in that sense one as you're saying is it the what is the world in which they will then be living and uh what their lives will consist of what they'll have to face the challenges that they'll have to face but also is your action itself making a difference do you actually personally think you know literally having this one other child is something you shouldn't do as in the same way that, you know, I just need now to fly less or recycle. Yeah. And I, I think the play is very good at addressing that not a sort of sense of futility of no matter how much you recycle or stop the tap from running when you're brushing your teeth, are you really making a practical difference to this problem? But then I think we do all have a, responsibility to do everything we can even if that is a very small um small sort of addition to the the fight against but it it adds up surely i mean she paints a pretty apocalyptic picture of the future of climate change it's very it's pretty graphic and it's interesting that this was written in 2011 so it's a while back now and i wonder how much the view of the world has moved on in terms of this subject and as it's portrayed in this play. And I, interestingly, he, Duncan McMillan said that when he wrote it, there was a certain sense that these people would have been more fringe possibly to the mainstream than the mainstream view. And that not, a, not that they were figures of fun for being worried about it, or not even that they're, they're, they were hypocritical, but they're, you know, there's the possibility that they could be talking a lot and not doing much, but that the, but the issue has become even more serious. I mean, it's not that it wasn't then, but it's so obvious now that this can't be just a light-hearted conversation anymore. And I think that the change of language from a climate change play to a climate crisis play is very relevant. I remember obviously being aware of the issues with global warming back then, but it Obviously, the conversation has moved on so much in the in the following years, and I I can see why there was a decision for such a high profile revival. Yes, although it's interesting because I don't know when I come back to it, and certainly when I saw it, the the tone of it, particularly in the first part of the play, is quite light, and therefore you it could be interpreted that in some ways these are these characters are the object of humorous parody in some form. But that's not that's no longer possible in a way with the kind of crisis now. 
And actually at the time that, of course, that the show came back to the Old Vic last year, I think, Extinction Rebellion were actually on the street and very much in the headlines. So this was, was front and center. This is not just about a couple of individuals having a notional conversation about this. This is very real. And I know that Duncan McMillan took it very seriously at the time as well, because he went on in, uh, um, as you know, because you published, I think, a, a later monologue that he co-wrote in 2015 and was presented at the Royal Court Theatre and was delivered by Professor Chris Rapley, who was previously head of the British Antarctic Survey and a director of the Science Museum about climate change. And it is actually, it's called 2071. It's actually a wonderfully clear summary of how the world's ecosystem works and includes statistics that affirm the indisputable impact that man is having on the world's climate. The play was entitled 2071 because I think that would be the year that Professor Rapley's daughter would be the same age he was when he actually presented this play. So he was also thinking, and Duncan working with him, about the future impact of our behaviors now on future generations, such as his daughter. And it actually essentially concludes, and this is back in 2015, where there were some positive signs happening, that there was still a substantial gap between what is required and what we're likely to actually do or achieve. And I'm not sure, you know, the view would be any better today, would it? No, it's really not. And um, I wonder, because I didn't work on the latest edition of the script, it being after my time at Oberon, I, I don't know if there were any text changes made to update the performance for a, a 2020 run or whether it was just kept as... I, well, I don't know that either, but I didn't. My impression when I saw the show was that it hadn't really been updated. It felt of its time, so that that is a question. How does that? How will that evolve? That view of this as a play of its time or not? Because mm. of course the world is changing in regard to this to this issue very much, and as 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 I think we've been trying to say, it is very front and center and more serious than when he first wrote it. I mean, one of the things you mentioned earlier, and they, in relation to the, this behavior, is they talk often about their concerns about the personal impact on the climate is also connected to their general notion of what it means to be a good person. They talk a lot about being good people in relation to each other and in comparison to other people and how they behave. What did you make of all that? I mean, it sounded very self-referential -ref and... Poking fun at the, I guess, the, the metropolitan elite who consider themselves superior because they watch films with subtitles and recycle. But then, you know, he, the male character is um, obsessed with his sort of status as a good person, but then he also kisses someone else and then cheats on his fiance and has some questionable moral decisions, but then very human decisions. So kind of making a rod for your own back of how you define being a good person is um, it's cleverly examined. It's true. And in a bit, I mean, I just popped into my head that thought about um, there's some years past when the government tried to preach moral behaviors and then <laughs> misbehave themselves. So there is, a, there is some, you know, certainly in the first half of the play, I think, they're more open to the criticism that they might be slightly hypocritical. And of course, as you say, his behavior is something less than impressive at times in terms of his integrity. And in fact, in the first half, they spend time sort of comparing themselves to others and going, well, you know, we're not the uneducated masses. We are, we are mm. doing the right things. And we are, in the, and in fact, even she goes as far as to saying, we are the ones who should be able to populate the world and others not, <laughs> which yeah. is pretty dangerous territory. Yeah, kind of monstrous thing to say, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it goes back to the, you know, what that we were saying at the beginning about the nature of the dialogue and that Duncan allows the characters to be as honest as that. So, he's, you know, he's taken a bit of risk. People would normally not necessarily confess to that openly. It's something that we're observing that she feels able, just about able to say in the privacy of this conversation with him. In the second half, maybe it gets a little bit more serious, the question of goodness and how they behave. Because, of course, they go through some trauma, don't they? I mean, she, and here's the spoiler, she has a miscarriage. And as a result, 
the whole thing takes a darker turn, doesn't it? You know, what has been a relatively light-hearted or, or light-touch debate, at least, about future parenthood takes a turn emotionally for, uh, to reality with this. And in the aftermath of the miscarriage, she seems to fall into some form of depression. It becomes very hard to reach. He doesn't know how to respond to her, to help her. She is unhappy with everything, including him. So he finds himself in a sort of it would a no-win position in some ways as well. And as you say, succumbs to an alternative outlet, kisses a colleague, and ultimately this list leads them to split up, to separate. And that all felt slightly rushed, I thought, in a way, but in the way the form of the play works, but still um, credible, believable. But thereafter, I think the way they respond to each other, and he in particular, his examination of what it means to be good is more serious, isn't it? And more he is really trying to figure out how can I be a better person? I mean, he doesn't initially behave that way, but he keeps seemingly keeps asking himself, what do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. It, it's, it's, a very, it's a very sort of human, forgiving way of looking at the pair of them, that neither is without fault, but we are we are just prone to making these mistakes and it's just part of who we are as a, as a people. Yes, it is because they, when they split, it's like they're not even in control of it themselves. It's like they, and they haven't, you, you don't really feel like they've come to a concrete decision of their own. It's, it's almost like they don't have the agency to do it. It's like what's happened to them has taken over and the way they behaved in response, they're barely able to manage. And the inevitable result is that they have to move somewhere else. They have to move on differently. And it just propels them to do that. And then he sort of drifts, doesn't he, in a way? You feel like he, you feel like what happens to him is he's just drifting with the wind, virtually. He's not steering his own course. Even, mm. you know, the affair. But then he gets involved with another woman, in fact, becomes engaged to another woman. They meet again and have a one night stand and she becomes pregnant, ironically, of course. And he then comes back, betrays his fiance. So again, she's, he's somewhat feckless, but deep down, what he does say ultimately is that he loves her, has always loved her, and would like to behave better towards her. So mm. there is some, there is some potential for real goodness in him that even with this misbehavior, he comes back to. I guess it's impossible to know how you would react to such trauma and grief when you lose the very thing that you have been defining yourself as, you know, as a parent, as a father or a mother, to then have it cruelly taken away from you while you're, before you've had an opportunity to really realize this dream or fantasy about being a parent. It must be terrible. And I, I can sympathize with the behavior they both indulge in, in a way, as a coping mechanism to deal with that. It's very, it's very human. Quite right. And, and of course, about the vision of their partnership or the state of their partnership, which also gets exploded and changes from what they had in mind and what it was. And that's very hard to cope with. And, and so they're buffeted by this, aren't they? And what they come to maybe is partly to do with just growing up, which is partly to do with uh, things that happen to us that we didn't plan, some dis disappointments, even worse, some tragedy, so that you know, one's understanding just deepens over time. You, you know, you learn some stuff and maybe you become better able to accommodate others, empathize with others and change one's own behavior is this is what growing up's a bit about. So you, I think you see that arc as well within the play. And then actually, what I wanted to ask you about was that having said all that, what I've just described is what actually happens. The play then fast forwards at some incredible rate mm. over the last just very few pages where their baby boy is born. And then the play moves through his entire life, including, you know, the end of his life and but literally in a line per decade or thereabouts. What do you make of this change of pace in the storytelling? I, I love it as a, as a structure. I think it, it makes me think back to what you were saying earlier. You spend so much, so much time 
considering the decision to have children and then once you've actually had them time just rockets past you and suddenly you're 50 60 70 years old and the children have left home and you don't know what to do with yourself careful right? careful what you're saying you're just <laughs> looking at me now aren't you you're just irrelevant now yeah <laughs> yeah you're right it goes so fast mm. I suppose the way that he tells it in this at this pace seems to affirm the premise that the decision they make has lifelong consequences, right? This is bang, we're just going to show you in one take almost, here is what happens as a consequence. It all, it all happens. But I felt, I have to say, I felt maybe it was in the theater, I felt it more even than reading it, I don't know, was that it all felt really rushed somehow. It felt imbalanced to me, to the rest of the play. And maybe even somewhat cliche, you know, because of the, the highlights that they pick out as milestones to mm-hmm. signify a life, that it, that's a bit pat. And I felt it sort of unbalanced, given the, the minutiae of the observations of their relationship for the whole hour and plus or whatever it is that lead up to this. It's a completely different thing, isn't it? And so it's sort of all of that it happens and then it's over, bang. I, f- I found that kind of unsettling and not entirely satisfying. I guess the, the strongest material is probably based on real life discussions he was having at the time. And then once you move more into the imagine that maybe that's why I guess um, I can't think of a way I would tie it up any better. Okay. Well, we'll maybe we'll agree to differ on that. He, I mean, he, he, he revisits parent issues of parenthood again and again in his work, I think, because one of the most electrifying um, scenes in people, places and things is the confrontation with the parents. Do you remember that scene towards the end of the play? I Mm -hmm. remember much about it, but that that to me feels like Lung's part two in a way. I think it's a more mature way of looking at these issues and really shows that development as a writer from this, you know, formally interesting one hour play to something much more on the grander scale and more kind of emotionally invasive. Yeah, that's a really good point, because I was going to come to that final question in a way is whether this is a time of life play and what its enduring relevance might be. Clearly, it's written, as we've said, at a particular time of life from him and the concerns that he had at that point, and as you've just said, potentially with less knowledge, of course, of what the rest of life will be. And as we mature, we have different view and will therefore express different things. What do you think? Do you think in 10 or 20 years, this play will still talk to people? I think so. I think it's enduringly popular because you do recognize yourself in it so much. It's been very popular with students and directors and people looking for audition materials because the dialogue is so springy and um, open to putting your own stamp on it. So I, I think it's always tough to know what plays will endure, but I, I do think this one, it may not seem entirely contemporary anymore, but it, it does feel sort of enduring and classic in a way. It's all, I, you're right, it's virtually impossible, frankly, to predict which plays will survive. And you're right, it is, we do recognize a lot of ourselves in these people. And maybe it is the social context in which they live and we, we find ourselves. The climate debate, as we've said, is still relevant, but may change. We did an episode about Harold Pinter's betrayal um, recently. And although the adulterous affair in that took place in the 1970s, and it's, the 1970s is a world that feels different to ours, particularly in gender politics. The core of the play about the personal damage that betrayal of trust causes between people didn't feel limited to those characters or that social time. I guess that the exploration of the relationship under these challenges, you know, whether to have children, dealing with a miscarriage, dealing with how we feel about each other's parents, Mm. Um, and living together or adultery, these things are never going to not be topical, I guess, or relevant to us. No, I think you're right. Actually, somewhere else I read a review that said it was a play about guilt, the guilt we feel towards ourselves and our own failings, the guilt towards our partners, our parents, and of course, guilt for the destruction of the planet and for future generations. We'll always have guilt 
Yeah, there's that there's that very powerful line at the end where she says, you know, her child doesn't really like seeing people of her generation because they blame them for their inaction, which I think is really, really telling. John and yeah, we must all be carrying that guilt at the moment because we've had it too good for too long. Thank you, George. Before we bring our curtain down, one of the fixtures of our podcast is that I ask our guests to recommend a play that we could devote an episode to. You've published so many writers and plays, so I realize that this is almost an impossible question, but perhaps you have a personal favorite that um, may not have had the attention it deserves, or it's just a play you absolutely love. My pick is going to be Mr. Burns by Anne Washburn. Did you see the um, Almeida? No, I missed it. It was at the Almeida, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, one of those plays that just changes your whole perception of what theatre can be. And it's just the most dazzlingly structured, innovative, compelling play. And Anne is, you know, most definitely a genius. And I don't use that word every day. But the London production was just one of the most stunning things I've ever seen. And met with this insane critical backlash in a way. Yes. I remember there was a really terrible review by Tim Walker, who just talked about how hot it was for about two thirds of the review and didn't really talk about the play at all. I don't know, Michael Billington, who has spent his life not watching The Simpsons because he's out at the theatre, didn't really get it. So I think, <laughs> but it, it had such a huge effect on so many people I've met who saw it that I, I would love to, I would certainly be tuning in to listen to a podcast about it. Maybe you could get Robert Ike to do it. Yeah, that would be fantastic. And it was, it, you know, he's done amazing work. And it was, uh, it was a bit of a landmark, as you say, it caused ripples. So it's a really good choice. And I'd love to come back to it. Thank you, George. Thank you so much for your time. As the curtain falls today, we have in watching one couple debate the impact of their lives on each other, their families, and the planet itself. We've been reminded that thinking about how to be good in all of these contexts may not guarantee that we will be, but that doing so might give us a better chance to do right by others in the world. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Thanks for listening. To listen to other episodes, to find out news about future episodes, or to leave comments about what you've heard, please visit us at www.theplaypodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter at The Play Pod. You're also welcome to email plays at theplaypodcast.com to suggest plays that we could talk about in future episodes. You can also register your suggestion on the website. Thanks again and see you next time.